and welcome back to another episode of Master's Class. We're talking about imperialism in Latin America. So, uh, in the course of the 19th century, the new nations of Latin America found themselves dependent on the West. Uh, the U.S. was especially prominent in economic and political affairs of its southern neighbors. And social and political inequalities also continued to characterize many Latin American nations. We're going to be looking at particularly Mexico as something of a case study uh, when it comes to that. So, when it came to the United States being come involved in Latin America, you know, President Roosevelt, uh, Theodore Roosevelt, that is, is something of like the poster child uh, for this sort of imperialistic involvement. It's an interesting, it's an interesting era. And at first, it seems as though everything is done out of, you know, sort of virtuous expectations. Um, we're going to talk to, uh, you know, we're talking about basically the Spanish being ousted from Latin America, um, you know, Cuba and, and their civil war and their own revolution. This seems like the perfect opportunity for America to sort of support its neighbors here. Um, well, they do up to a point, uh, and there's clearly gain for the United States in helping them to oust the remnants of the old Spanish Empire from their Latin American neighbors. Now, when we get to the 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 you know the, the revolution in Cuba, uh, what becomes you know the Spanish American War as we know it in the United States uh, in 1895, it sort of kicks off. I mean, the Spanish American War we'll we'll know it as Spanish American War in 1898, but it, it's it's a years long conflict. Uh, and we have uh, Jose Marti, who is something of a revolutionary himself, and he is sort of fighting against Valeriano Whaler, um, General Whaler uh, in Cuba. And here is Jose Marti, uh, poet, philosopher, essayist, journalist, translator, professor, publisher, and guerrilla revolutionary war, you know, warrior. Um, he's going to lead his people to liberation. Uh, he wants to oust the Spanish. He is against the reconcentration camp policies that Whaler has instituted, where they're basically rounding up uh, villages of people into these sort of exactly what it sounds like they're camps, and uh, they are ill supplied. Um, they're, they're they're not well outfitted. People will die there. They're going to get sick there. Um, and where Whaler says. Uh, where that policy fails, the rope and fire will suffice. So you can really tell that, obviously, things are not great in Cuba. So you have to pardon the Americans to want to get involved. Uh, the, the, this is their neighbor. This is in close proximity to the states. And there's also clear goals, right? There's clear ambition here for, from the United States perspective. Uh, by helping the Cubans out in this revolution, they will effectively become a protectorate of the United States, and this is going to give a permanent military base for the United States in Guantanamo Bay. And by the treaty that ends the war, uh, after the destruction of the Spanish Navy, Puerto Rico is going to become annexed by the United States. We've also talked about how the Philippines uh, will also essentially come under the control of the United States as well. Uh, and it's going to keep extending. So if we can see from our map here, in 1903, President Theodore Roosevelt, who was a rough rider, uh, he had his own special cavalry unit uh, in the Spanish-American War where he sort of claims military fame. Um, he's, and it's, excess, it's a successful conflict. It's short, it's brief from the American perspective, highly successful. So Theodore Roosevelt is riding, you know, um, a lot of popularity and notoriety uh, by the time that uh, he becomes president of the United States. He's seen as a uh, an achiever. He gets things done, a real progressive. And so he's also going to support rebellion in Latin America because guess what? So far, it seems like it, it really pans out for the United States uh, to, so, so when Panama separates from Colombia, uh, to establish itself as a new nation, the U.S. supports it, 
and gets control of a 10-mile strip of land through the country. And that might not seem like such a big deal, uh, but with some, you know, with some interesting terraforming uh, and some engineering, we're going to get the Panama Canal out of that, making the most of that 10-mile strip. And this is huge, as we can kind of see from our map right here, uh, this Panama Canal. Uh, now you have a way from the Atlantic to the Pacific and vice versa for trade routes. I mean, this is huge. I mean, originally, if you were from trying to, uh, you know, export something from San Francisco, well, as you can see from the trade route, uh, we have to go all the way around South America just to get to the other side of the United States. Well, now you're effectively cutting that uh, down, you know, eight to 10 hours, that, that passage trip. Uh, that's a pretty significant chunk of time that you're eliminating from the overall voyage. Um, this is a great feat of engineering. Um, so this is, this benefits financially both North America and South America. Uh, so in 1904, you know, the biggest aspect of what comes out of the U.S. and Latin American involvement is, once again, there's a, a substantial amount to be gained here. So there is this Monroe Doctrine. If we can recall, President Monroe basically said uh, that if any outside European force tries to interfere in the proceedings, if you will, of the Americas, uh, then the United States will go to war with them. And at the time, it's kind of viewed as a joke. Now, not so much. Uh, now we have the American peril. It's real. It's here. The United States has uh, leapt forward tremendously uh, at, by this point at the turn of the century, economically, industrially, technologically, militarily. Uh, they're a real force to be reckoned with. And Roosevelt reckon, uh, recognizes this. And this is where the Roosevelt Corollary to the Monroe Doctrine comes into play. Uh, European powers threaten to send warships to Santo Domingo and the Dominican Republic to collect debts that are owed to them. Well, the United States is saying, well, you know what we're going to do? Roosevelt initiates the Roosevelt Corollary, and we don't care if a Latin American country is guilty of chronic misconduct by European powers, such as the inability to repay debts, the U.S. will go ahead and take control of the debt. So this is a powerful move. Uh, one, it semi-absolves Santo Domingo and the Dominican Republic um, of their debt because it has now been assumed by North America, by the United States specifically, I should say. If European powers have a problem with it, they can see about the United States and now they have to negotiate with a major military player that's finally seen and emerged on a world scale. Uh, and as a result of this, this gives the United States uh, an opportunity to utilize that debt by selling it off to businesses. So the government can sell off, say, like land contracts, if you will, as a means uh, to, to pay off this debt, to remove the debt from uh, the government, both, you know, from the Dominican Republic as well as from the U.S. federal debt. So what's happening here is a policy of dollar diplomacy. So we're trying to strengthen our presence, the United States, in Latin American countries. And one way to do that is to assume their debt. By assuming their debt, you can sell off that debt to other businesses uh, in the form of, say, you know, land contracts, uh, which you can use to mine or to farm or to raise cattle. Uh, big things, those are big industries in, in South America. I mean, huge. And as a result of this dollar diplomacy, uh, as more oil, oil is a huge, massive, uh, this is going to be a massive money-making field um, as South America at this time is sort of blessed with oil reserves and they're being exploited tremendously uh, at this point by United States interests. Um, Doheny Oil is a great example. William Randolph Hearst, a popular uh, newspaper uh, owner, in New York City, 
he is going to buy up massive amounts of acreage, thousands of acres of land in Mexico alone. Um, and of course, raise cattle. This, this is hugely profitable. So basically what we're saying is there's an increasing American business presence and interest in South America as a result of this sort of dollar diplomacy. Uh, the United States warns off any outside involvement through his military. Uh, when opportunity presents itself, assumes debt of Latin American countries, sells off debt to American businesses, uh, you know, in the form of like land contracts, things of that nature, oil rights and oil interests. Um, and as a result of this, because the United States soon replaces Europe as the source of loans and debt and investments, uh, direct U.S. investments reach three and a half billion of a total 7.5 worldwide debt of 7.5 billion. So the United States presence is real in South America. And to ensure that business interests are, you know, going on without a hitch, uh, businessmen have the guarantee of the United States military, primarily through the Marines, being sent into Cuba, Mexico, Guatemala, Honduras, Nicaragua, Panama, Colombia, Haiti, the Dominican Republic, to protect those interests. And you can see the U.S. Marines stay in some of these Latin American countries for very long periods of time to ensure the success of these new investments, right? These American interests. Um, and as a result of this, uh, this is going to see, and we're going to look at Mexico as a great example of this, we're going to see certain elites of society. Uh, there are there are just a few, a handful, um, and by a handful, I might say in, in Mexico, like a thousand uh, families who basically control the land, uh, who have carved up the entirety of a country, and they want to make sure that their United States neighbors, you know, their their American, uh, North American United States neighbors and business allies are are, are happy. Uh, they want to maintain that because they profit tremendously from it. Whereas the majority of Latin Americans are going to resent this interference because we're not going to see just through dollar diplomacy the influence economically and, and through business that the United States will exert in Latin American countries, but it inevitably plays out into the political arena, into the political sphere, uh, helping to support, to overthrow, and to dictate who will be in charge of those respective governments in South America. So let's talk about Mexico. After 1870, you have large landowners in Latin America, and with money and power and influence over how people are operating, inevitably you get into politics and governing. Um, so Argentina and Chile, land-holding elites control the governments. I mean, this is nothing new. This is, you know, world history. Uh, this is par for the course. What's new, though, is that they're going to start to adopt constitutions similar to that of the United States. Um, and of course, your other European democracies, i.e. England, would be a great example, Great Britain. Uh, but the ruling elites always try to limit voting rights. There are, there's no universal voting right or suffrage uh, that exists at this point in the Latin American countries. Uh, so that's going to change. Uh, it's going to change through revolution. Uh, it's going to change with the throwing off of the shackles of the remnants of the old Spanish Empire. Uh, and by the time we get to the turn of the century, some Latin American countries are doing better than others. Uh, Mexico is very much on the struggle bus at this point. And we're going to see this because of the succession of you know the old conservative order, the elites of society, um, versus and their you know American business allies uh, versus the revolutionaries and and the revolutionaries by the way will also have their own American allies 
uh, there's a back and forth. Uh, just as there's a different interest in South America, there's different interest uh, in the United States, uh, you know, based on where you stood, uh, you know, whether you're an American business owner with direct uh, land ties to to Latin America, or if you were in the government and you didn't actually make any money, and you just saw that there was a humanitarian crisis. So there, there, there's a lot going on here, but let's try to break this down as best we can. So you have ruling elites like Porfirio Diaz. Um, he is a representative of the large landowners. He's a dictator. He is for the interests of the ruling elite. Um, he rules Mexico for a fairly long stretch of time, as you can see right here, 1877 to 1911. There's a lot of change that exists in this period of time. Uh, so he's about the old conservative regime, centralized government, uh, very pro-military, of course. The military helps keep him in power. He is all about foreign capitalists, you know, get more U.S. involvement in here. We want to get more factories have them, you know, get more land rights, more land. We can then utilize, uh, you know, other landowners of which there's only about a thousand families in Mexico at this time who control basically all the land, uh, leaving about 97% of the Mexican population to be literally property less. They are landless. They own zero land, uh, not, not a bit. Uh, the Catholic Church supports Diaz, you know, the old conservative regime. Um, and those landowners, they benefit tremendously from, you know, outside foreign investments. All these groups benefit from Diaz being in power. In, in power. So uh, we're going to start to see that 97% they're going to call for revolution. And of course, as we've seen from other cases, revolution can be nonviolent, like in India. But there's also violent revolution in India, as we went over. Uh, the Sepoy Mutiny, great example. Uh, not everything can be Gandhi-esque. Uh, and then, of course, Mexico serves as a great example of violent revolution. Uh, and there's going to be an about base. Uh, we're going to see it with some of the early revolutionaries in Mexico. So. Uh, Diaz has this clearly dictatorial reign. Wages for workers keep declining. Profits are increasing for, like I said, 95 to 97 percent of the rural population owns no land, whereas the 1,000 families uh, own almost all of Mexico. They are profiting tremendously. Um, until one day, a liberal landowner, Francisco Madero, highly educated, He's going to actually study. He's going to attend college at the University of California in Berkeley. And then he's going to finish up uh, his advanced degree in France, I believe at the University of Paris, in agricultural studies, where he comes back to Mexico and he applies these sort of really advanced, forward-thinking agricultural practices in, on a, a cotton plantation that he's going to wind up inheriting when he's like 21 years old. Um, from like 21 to like 31, um, he is going to be highly successful. He makes a lot of money on his cotton plantation. Um, and he pays his workers above the standard wage uh, on his plantation. You know, they're well provided. They have access to the best medical care on his plantation. He takes really good care of his employees, of his laborers. But he notices that he is so different from these, you know, other thousand families who are, you know, come from wealth, they're well educated, um, you know, they have all this land. He's not like them. He doesn't think like them. Uh, he's a very forward-thinking, progressive individual, uh, and he is going to start to go to these sort of um, political meetings and these clubs, and he's going to talk about revolution. Uh, he's going to talk about you know, modeling the Mexican government more off of, you know, say the United States government or the French government. Um, there needs to be a constitution with a guaranteed security of rights for the average Mexican. And 
uh, he's going to open the door to revolution. He's going to publish a book, actually, uh, basically calling for, inciting uh, revolution. And as a result of this, uh, Porfirio Diaz, who we can see pictured here, very, you can tell, like, very dictatorial, uh, very much of the old regime, Diaz here. He is going to try to oust Madero, pictured here. You know, he's going to try to run him out of town, and Madero is going to basically slink across the border, and he's going to hide out and advocate for revolution while he's in the United States, sort of in hiding. He writes another book. He publishes it, and it calls for a specific date to where he's going to come back into Mexico and for the revolutionaries to arm themselves. He abandons the nonviolent revolution idea of his first book. In his second book, he calls for armed revolution. He sees that he sees what the Diaz government is doing. They are violently suppressing any dissent. Uh, and so it's when he sees that that he realizes this is never going to change unless there's a counter force. There needs to be revolutionaries. Uh, we have to take up arms. Um, and as a result of his publishing the second book, he's actually going to get kicked out of the United States because, well, you can't, it breaks the U.S.'s neutrality laws. You know, he is openly inciting revolution in another country. He's trying to get, you know, maybe the U.S. involved. So they, they, they kick him out, and he's like, fine, I have to go lead the revolution anyway. Well, what winds up happening, instead of, like, you know, maybe at least the 800 armed revolutionaries, he was probably hoping for thousands, uh, only just a few wind up meeting him when he crosses across the border again, and he's kind of dismayed by this. Uh, he's, he's kind of brokenhearted. Uh, and half those revolutionaries that meet up with him aren't even armed. He's like, what are we going to do? This is not enough to overthrow a government. Uh, and he's kind of dejected by this. Um, but he shouldn't be. And this goes back to the idea like the pen is mightier than the sword. Because independent of Madero, people who have heard his words, they have read his book, they have gone to these other... And those who couldn't read uh, are met by those who can. And they are going to spread the language of Madero's books that call for revolution and the ideas found within at these sort of political clubs and these gatherings. And it is going to spark off uh, these outside, independent, or I shouldn't say outside, but, in, in the, but, but, but these other revolutionaries in Mexico, and they're going to take up arms, and they're going to lead in their areas, particularly in and around Chihuahua, uh, a massive success. Uh, Chihuahua is going to be a hotbed for revolutionary activity. Uh, and we see this in the form of two particular individuals uh, uh, who become incredibly infamous. Um, the first, of course, being Pancho Villa, uh, as we can see pictured here. Also here. Pancho Villa, father grew up quite poor, um, and he himself was a Miner. He was a laborer. He was a ranch hand. Uh, he did all these things. Then eventually he turns to bank robbing and horse thievery, um, train robbery, uh, bandit lifestyle. Uh, and he and his bandits become revolutionaries. Um, and he's a prominent leading fi figure uh, in trying to oust Diaz and basically everyone else who's going to take up just about everybody else who takes up the mantle um, as president of Mexico. Um, he takes short periods of, of non-revolutionary activity, depending on who's, you know, acting as president. But he's fairly consistent with his revolutionary activity. Um, he's seen as, you know, kind of the Mexican Robin Hood, uh, stealing from the rich, giving back to the poor. There are incidents. Uh, of reported where he will come across these large landowners um, and force them to sign basically blank documents, which they're going to fill in later. Uh, what, what ultimately it says the 2,000 square acres of land that you control, well, that's going to be dispersed uh, to the people of your community now. So now everyone's going to own an equal share of land. 
Uh, except for you, original landowner, you will finally know what it's like to be poor uh, and you will own zilch, zero, nada. And they are going to sweep through the countryside, sort of spreading this, you know, revolutionary justice. And they're always against the federal army um, in just brutal battles. Now, Madero, eventually with the support of guys like Pancho Villa and, of course, Emiliano Zapata, uh, another revolutionary who is inspired by Madero's words, uh, he's a, a chief follower of Francisco Madero, um, and they're going to be ultimately successful in forcing Diaz from power in 1911, and Madero, if you can see Zapata here, uh, Madero is going to have the support of Villa and Zapata. Uh, and so Madero will become president after they oust Diaz. Uh, Diaz is going to make his way to Spain in exile. And uh, Madero <clears throat> is going to basically tell Zapata and Villa particularly Zapata, to disarm. Like, the job is done, the revolution is over, we're good here. Um, you know, we're going to advocate for social justice and democracy. He initiates a, a lot of forward-thinking reforms, but he doesn't have a lot of time. He's only in office, as you, as you can see, from 1911 to 1913. Uh, the expectations of the revolutionaries and of the people of the rural countryside they just had too much expectation of Madero, and he wasn't solving problems fast enough to their liking. Um, Zapata is actually quite disappointed in Madero after he takes power because, you know, this whole idea like, no, 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 disarm, and, you know, all the land that you seized from landowners for Indians, for the native peoples of Mexico, well, you have to give that back to the government so we can legally... So we have to legally give it back to people. We can redistribute the land legally. We can't just seize stuff illegally like uh, you and Via did. And that's what really disappoints them in Madero, uh, is that they feel he's taking a step back and he might be conforming to the old regime like Diaz did during his very dictatorial reign. So uh, things are not all hunky-dory. Things aren't all peaceful yet. Um, so Madero's ineffectiveness sort of creates a demand for agrarian reform, right? Uh, we want to return the land to the masses of the landless peasants, and we're seizing these estates of the wealthy landowners. But Madero, you know, wants to reach an agreement with him on land reforms. You have to disarm, and we have to do this legally. We can't keep seizing land illegally like you guys and that's where the, the revolution takes kind of a hit um, and as a result of this uh, it's going to be very easy for the enemies of Madero the or the actual old regime the old conservative order uh, American business interests uh, the wealthy landowners the Catholic Church they're all against him uh, and so what's going to wind up happening with Madero is he is going to be ousted uh, in a conflict. We're going to talk about this guy in just a second. Uh, Felix Diaz, the nephew of Porfirio Diaz, has this, you know, some friends in the Mexican Federal Army, and they're going to try to oust Madero. Uh, one such general, Victoriano Cuerta, is going to battle the nephew of Diaz, Felix Diaz, openly with artillery in Mexico City. And they're blowing up like churches, they're blowing up buildings, you know, hundreds of civilians get killed. And eventually they reach an agreement uh, brokered by a U.S. and the U.S. ambassador to Mexico at the time, uh, uh, Henry Lane Wilson. And basically the idea is. Uh, you're going to lead a coup against Madero. And after they lead the coup against Madero, Madero is seized and they ask, uh, you know, this U.S. ambassador, Henry Lane Wilson, uh, what should we do with Madero? 
and he simply tells Huerta whatever is best for Mexico. And what Huerta hears is, well, assassinate him and become president. So he's going to shoot Madero in the head. Uh, he'll be, you know, killed by a firing squad. And then Huerta will seize the presidency of Mexico. And this is where Villa, Zapata, and Carranza come into play. Carranza is actually a governor. Uh, and he is going to link up with Zapata and Villa and say, we need, because Zapata and Villa both agree that they're not the ones to lead Mexico. They can lead the armed resistance, but they need an educated elite to actually run the show. Um, they agree on that much uh, because they don't, they don't strive to be president for power. They want to be like these guys, uh, like Huerta, like Diaz. So they are going to battle against Huerta valiantly until eventually Huerta has to flee the country and Carranza becomes president. And it's during his presidency that we're going to see uh, a new a new regime, right? Uh, it's somewhat successful. Uh, it's during his regime that we see universal male suffrage from a new constitution the Mexican Constitution of 1917. Uh, so we're going to get universal male suffrage is on the table, land reform policies where the land will be redistributed. Uh, it's going to establish limits on foreign investors so the United States can't just keep on sending business guys over assuming debt and buying up thousands and thousands and thousands of acres of land, shutting out uh, opportunity for uh, Mexico. Uh, for Mexican businessmen and, and, and business interest in Mexico. Uh, a set, it limits the working hours in the day, raises the minimum wage limit. Uh, limit. Uh, you can unionize and, you know, workers of those unions have voting rights. Um, so the, the revolution really does help out tremendously. And you'll, f you'll find this as well, like, look, during the nursing period for women, they shall have two special rest periods each day of a half hour each for nursing of their infants. That's tremendous. Equal wages shall be paid for equal work regardless of sex or nationality. Very forward thinking stuff. Uh, unfortunately, it had to come about as a result of you know a lot of violence, but that is that's that's revolution. But despite Carranza being able to you know successfully put forward uh, some of these ideas here. He too will become ousted. Uh, he's going to be assassinated. You're going to see a common theme here, right? Uh, by this guy. Uh, he's a general of Carranza's, and as a general, he feels as though he can't rise any further. Carranza doesn't want to promote uh, from within the Federal Army because, well, it seems like the Federal Army has generals, Huerta, uh, who have always been along the ride of the old regime since the Diaz days. Um, they, they are reflections of the old conservative order, right? Uh, and as a result, um, they can't, he doesn't want to promote those guys. So uh, Obregon is going to assassinate Carranza and seize the presidency. And then Zapata and Villa, once again, have to be dealt with. Uh, Villa is going to be given 25,000 acres to basically make him go away, and he will for a time until 1923 when a mysterious group of men assassinate him while he's taking a car ride uh, in his Ford Model T. And uh, Zapata will be lured to a hacienda uh, by agents of Obregon who are pretending to be revolutionaries, and they are going to assassinate Zapata and his men uh, at this hacienda. Uh, and the revolution is effectively done. But Mexico now has this, this national pride uh, that has been established, and there's a new Mexican identity, uh, and, there are, and there are actionable rights for the average Mexican as a result of the Mexican Constitution of 1917. So as far as revolutions go, uh, it wasn't a failure. Uh, there was actual change. Um, and now we know for sure, at this point forward, uh, there has been a limit to outside interference uh, that's put on by American businessmen as a result of this Mexican Constitution. 
but they do recognize in Latin America raw products just like we see in Africa and India are, are the rule of the day sugar silver uh, coffee uh, this is these are the money-making machines and we need to export those so we can keep importing finished textiles machines and other luxury goods from Europe and the United States um, minerals as well I mean oil that that's going to be big money makers so once again raw materials for industrialized goods becomes the 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 exchange at the turn of the century and despite revolutions in say Mexico and other areas of Latin America you still have slavery like conditions slavery is not officially abolished until 1888 but the plantations to produce these raw goods the working conditions for by and large will be quite unsatisfactory um, but you'll also see a rise of the middle sectors, right? Middle class, lawyers, merchants, shopkeepers, business people, school teachers, professors, bureaucrats. Uh, and they are just as filled with a national pride as the working class, as the poor, but they don't call for revolution as much as they might just call for reform. And that's very common that we see in other areas, particularly you see that in India, right? So they would rather liberal reform, not revolution. Uh, education and decent incomes. That's all they're going to advocate for, really. And of course, you know, if they had the right to vote, they generally side with the landholding elites. And labor unions. Uh, they are going to grow. Working classes grow, so labor unions too grow, especially after 1914. Uh, in some Latin American countries, unlike in Mexico, where they don't have the right to vote, uh, the general strike becomes an instrument for change. Because if we can't vote for change, we can stifle the work of the wealthy of society. Because they are stifling the ability of the working class and the poor to even participate in you know, government uh, by voting. And we see a drastic increase as well uh, of not just industrial workers, but in industrialization. And to industrialize, you'll see many Latin American countries bringing in immigrants from Europe, the United States, uh, in, in just as far as Europeans go between 1880 and 1914. We'll see 3 million Europeans, primarily Italians and Spaniards, settle into Argentina. And Buenos Aires, as a result of this urbanization and hiring these um, engineers and architects and other professionals uh, from Europe, is going to get the moniker the Paris of South America. And the overall population will boom 750,000 by 1900, 2 million by 1914. And they become increasingly urbanized, less rural. The shift occurs. You can see that reflected in the landscape of Buenos Aires even today. All right, folks, that'll do it for us this session. Have a great rest of your day. I'll see you 